Naturality TV presents Reimagine That with Chris Mann, offering refreshing reality with a retro twist. This week, Chris interviews a true classic Dallas villainess, actress Morgan Brittany, plus TV Guide senior editor William Keck reports on J.R. Ewing's funeral and other current South Fork drama. And once more, we'll explore the world of nocturnal drama with our very own dream interpreter, Yvonne Reba. And now, introducing your host, Chris Mann. Thank you, Linda Kay, our vintage-voiced announcer and producer. And welcome back, everybody, to Reimagine That, the Retroality.tv podcast where retro pop meets forward thought. It's March 8th, and this is episode 17, a very special, fun, exciting, intriguing, we hope, episode devoted to Dallas, the classic Dallas, the new TNT revival of Dallas, the whole 35-plus year saga. And we are excited to say that we have the first of our two-part exclusive interview with Dallas's Queen of Egypt. Morgan Brittany, a delightful actress who goes back to the 50s as a child actress. She shares some of her stories in this first of two parts about her early career in Hollywood and how she would ultimately reimagine and reinvent herself as Morgan Brittany, which helped give her the steely resolve, perhaps, to land the role of Catherine Wentworth, the devious half-sister of Pam Ewing and Cliff Barnes. And we want to see her back on Dallas. There has been a lot of fan clamoring over the last year or so to get Morgan back on Dallas. And now, especially that, sadly, Larry Hagman is no longer with us, it's time to bring in the classic villainess from the 80s. Monday, March 11th, TNT airs J.R. Ewing's funeral. And uh, we have a another special guest here, William Keck, senior editor at TV Guide. He also has the uh, popular column, Kex Exclusives. He shares some insight about this episode on Monday and what is to come beyond in the remaining episodes of the uh, second season of TNT's revival, Continuation of Dallas. We'll get into Will's interesting journey with Dallas and his news bits uh, here shortly. And then we'll go into part one of our fun journey with Morgan. Then stay tuned for uh, our segment with Yvonne Reba, our dream interpreter, who has her own Texas-sized dream that she analyzes. Nothing is nightmarish as the 1985-86 season of Dallas, which we would find out later, was all a dream in Victoria Principal's mind. Uh, Victoria Principal, by the way, recently announced that she would, under no circumstances, be coming back to Dallas. So Will talks about that. Morgan talks about that. We've got some exclusives here on their takes on this breaking news. And I say, you know what? Let's pave the way for the Dallas classics who want to come back, who are grateful for the ongoing love and the ongoing storytelling that TNT is doing with this iconic series. And as the super cool website DallasDivasDerby.com revealed last year, Morgan is at the very top of the list of the women of Dallas that the fans want back. Uh, Ultimate Dallas, Dallas Fanzine, all of this amazing online community of fans of the classic show and the TNT revival are all sitting on the edge of their seats waiting to see what JR's masterpiece is, where's Pam, what did they do with her, and I personally think that Catherine Wentworth was an integral part of that mystery, and let's hope that we see her, if not by the cliffhanger this spring, then certainly by season three. 
A uh, couple of other notes before we start. I want to also uh, share that I had the opportunity to interview Linda Gray, another lovely Dallas lady, for the February issue of Well Bella magazine. That's a national health and beauty magazine distributed through GNC stores. Uh, I interviewed Linda just about 10 days before Larry suddenly took a turn for the worse. Uh, so that interview is at wellbella.com, and shortly they should be posting the audio podcast of that interview that I did with Linda in November. So check out wellbella.com. And as we remember Larry Hagman ourselves and pay tribute to him via those who knew and loved him, in this instance, Morgan Brittany and William Keck got to know Larry over the years. I also want to give a quick nod, a, a salute to the late Bonnie Franklin. What a courageous woman recently lost her battle with uh, pancreatic cancer. She changed the face of 70s television herself as a feminist icon, really, as the star of One Day at a Time, as a uh, divorcee. And, you know, she takes with her a lot of love from her uh, TV daughters and from the public. And so, you know, thank you, Bonnie. And also our hearts go out to Valerie Harper, whom we all have just learned is battling a terminal brain cancer. And if anyone can beat this, it's someone like Valerie with that positive, contagious energy and attitude at age 73. I think she can kick cancer's butt. Um, so let's all hold good energies for that amazing woman. Uh, cancer has taken too many people, too many beloved icons, too many people in our own lives, and let's just hold a candle lit for Valerie and all of those young and old who are fighting the good fight as Farrah Fawcett did a few years ago. On a happier note, let's now escape into the world of South Fork. And we'll start off with our chat with William Keck and check out his exclusives at tvguide.com and every week at TV Guide Magazine. Uh, he is the ultimate Dallas insider, so let's go straight to him. William Keck, it is great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. Great to be uh, here with you, Chris. I appreciate it. You know, we have followed all of your amazing coverage of Dallas and TV Guide. You're the senior editor and a columnist there. Before we talk about your journey, sort of from fan of the CBS original to the ultimate Dallas insider now, can you give us a kind of a tease of a Kex exclusive about JR's funeral, which is set to air Monday, March 11th, right? Yeah, well, you know, I've seen the episode, Chris, and it's called JR's Masterpiece, and, you know, it really is the masterpiece of all the producers, writers, and actors involved. It is so well done. They nailed it, and Larry Hagman would have loved it. Oh, perfect. And you were there on set, right? Do you have a cameo at this funeral? <laughs> you know, I, I do. I do. I was on set. Um, they filmed uh, the memorial scenes at the Petroleum Club, um, which is an exclusive members-only club on the top of a, a skyscraper in Dallas. And uh, they don't allow filming there, but because of, of the show and who Larry was and mm -hmm. you know the economy that the, the show brought to the city, they allowed him to shoot there. Wow. It was a great setting. It really felt like the old Dallas set, the old Ewing set, a lot of wood. Mm -hmm. And they uh, they decorated the whole room with, with photos of Larry throughout the years. Wow. And there were wreaths. And, you know, they had fun with the flowers. They put names on there of, of characters from other shows. And, you know, things that wouldn't be picked up on camera, but were fun little in-jokes for the set designers. Uh -huh. And they have a whole bunch of returning actors we haven't seen in years. Uh, yeah. Deborah Shelton, you know, who plays Mandy. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, the JR's child bride, Callie, you know, is there. And, of course, mm -hmm. Ray and Lucy and Gary Ewing's there, Ted Shackelford. So there's a lot, wow. lot that goes on. And, and yes, and I do have a little camp. You know, I wore black. And so they, they said, you know what, why don't we throw you in a scene? So there's a scene where Gary and, uh, and Sue Ellen are contemplating taking a drink. You know, they're both recovering alcoholics. And you can see me in the background just having a grand old time. <laughs> you weren't serving them any, were you? <laughs> no, I, I, I wish I had. 
<laughs> no, I wasn't them. I support their sobriety. There you go. Well, that is so cool. But I will say, I, I don't want to give anything away, but um, you know, fans who have been missing the old Suellen will enjoy JR's Masterpiece episode because ah. it's not surprising that if anything were to tempt Suellen back to the bottle, it would be losing the love of her life. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, Linda Gray has you know, been vocal about not wanting to go there, but the show is sort of toyed with, you know, her history. And, and that's one thing I think is interesting with this show, how they weave the fabric of the history of Dallas into this reboot. You know, and I will, I will tell you that Linda is really torn about this. Yeah. I mean, yes, it is a great storyline, a great challenge for her as an actress, but she says to this day she still receives letters from women who got sober because of Sue Ellen's journey, and she wow. feels a little irresponsible for Sue Ellen as a mature woman to fall off the wagon, mm-hmm. and uh, she's wrestling with these, these storylines. She really is. She's an amazing woman, and, you know, I, I love how they are making her stronger and more uh, powerful these days. You know, yeah. are we going to touch on these things at the Paley Fest? That's going to be this weekend, March 10th, is that correct? Yes, yeah, Sunday, March 10th at 1 p.m. in Beverly Hills at the Saban Theater. Perfect, and you're the moderator. I am, and I definitely intend to touch on, on these things, on how Linda feels about these storylines, and, you know, and sure, she's a team player, and she's sitting right next to her producer's. So she's going to, you know, uh, be respectful. But uh, yeah. she's also an honest woman. And I think she really will explain why she's torn about this. And I think it's going to be a great conversation. And it's it being live streamed. So even if you can't attend in person, you can go onto the Paley site and watch it wherever you are. Oh, perfect. And we'll yeah. make sure to give that link to our listeners here because people will want to right. uh, engage in that, at least remotely. And then there's been all of this speculation for really a year. It sort of culminated in the last week about Victoria Principal's possible return to South Fork as Pam Ewing, which she yeah. recently finally shot down in a press statement. You know, what can you tell us about all this drama? Is it all just a <laughs> terrible dream? <laughs> you know, it is. It is a terrible dream. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's funny, Chris. Um, the reality of it is that the show is about to introduce a Pam storyline. Mm. Um, and it kicks off in the JR Memorial episode. Uh, some information materializes about this character. Mm. So as Jesse Metcalf has been teasing that this mm-hmm. could lead to Victoria's return. It was certainly his hope to, to work with her. And what an amazing storyline it would have been. Yeah. Um, having Bobby in love with Anne and Christopher abandoned by his mother and having this character return after all these years. Yeah. My guy would have twisted things up. What I've had to learn uh, this week is that beloved Pam is not Victoria Principal. They're two different people. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Pam is gone. Um, yeah. And although the show has kept her alive, uh, in Victoria's mind, the character died the minute the explosion happened, and she wiped her hands of the show at that time. She did. And Linda Gray has told me that, that she does not want to come play with the cast, and mm-hmm. Patrick has said that she's perfectly content not being an actress and not being involved. So, unfortunately, uh, yeah, yeah, Victoria set the record straight that fans who have been dying for a Bobby Pam reunion are going to be eternally disappointed, and that's Victoria's decision. That's that's her gift to fans. You know, that's uh, that's too bad, because what an opportunity here to bring this story forward and reconnect with the legacy of this show and the fans. I always sort of got the impression that she was a little bit of an odd man out, even during the original run of the show, whereas Larry and Patrick and Linda were all sort of team spirit. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's not just, I mean, yes, um, Linda, Patrick, and Larry were the real high threesome, but Mm -hmm. you can add to that Steve Canelli, you know, who was Mm. very close to the group. You can add to that Mary Crosby, even though she shot JR, she and Larry were incredibly close, and Larry actually walked her down the aisle at one of of her weddings. Yep. Um, So it was a very tight cast, and, yeah, Victoria was, was an outsider. Yeah, yeah. I think by her own choosing. By her own choosing. For whatever reason, I don't know. Well, darn it, Victoria. She's missing out. She's missing out. But <laughs> yeah. to be quite honest, I don't know if this show really really wanted her. Yeah, And that's something yeah. maybe we'll find out. You know, I, I think that if this is the case, if she's made it known all these years that she doesn't want to play, then, then maybe they were respecting that and just writing the show around her. And I, mm-hmm. I have to say, kudos to Brenda Strong. Yep, you know, yeah. it's very hard to step into Bobby's bed after mm-hmm. that great love story of Pam and, and Bobby. And I think Brenda Strong has done an amazing job. She and has. in the episode where she 
was on the stand where we learned about you know her background and the tortures that Anne had to endure. I think that, that fans really maybe were on the fence about her. Hopefully, you're giving her more of a chance because I think she's doing a great job. She's doing a splendid job, and, it, and that's a great storyline. You know, speaking of terrible dreams or really great dreams, you've fulfilled a pretty fantastic dream in covering <laughs> this Dallas revival for TV Guide. I mean, we're talking multiple cover stories, multiple trips to South Fork. Just what kind of trip has this been for you as a guy who, as a kid, grew up on the CBS original? Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it has been amazing. I, I took my first trip to, to South Fork when Charlene Tilton and Harry Winkler uh, produced a special right. there uh, a few years ago called Return to South Fork. And everybody, including Victoria, took part in that. And that was really a dream. I actually mm. ended up on a plane. I was on a plane with Larry and wow. Patrick and Linda. And, and when, when we landed and I saw them there, it was just so bizarre uh-huh. to be traveling with the aliens and then walking the <laughs> ranch with, with Patrick and his wife and sitting by the pool with Victoria and Ken Percival. It was really trippy. And yeah. uh, over the years since then, I have amassed quite a, a Dallas memorabilia collection. And I have a mm-hmm. whole room in my house that's dedicated to uh, to South Fork. So, yeah, so when cool. I thought the show might be coming back, I was pretty much doing backflips. It's just really <laughs> exciting. And then to be moderating on Sunday is is sort of the, the ultimate cherry on the on the Sunday. Oh, I bet. It's so cool and surreal, I'm sure. Well, I mean, Chris, it would be like you moderating the Three's Company panel. You know, <laughs> right. if, 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 if we had, you know, it's the same thing. We both lost our icons. I mean, yeah. I lost Larry and you lost John Ritter, who, who I'm right there with you. He was my hero. Yeah. I love that man. Another great JR, John Ritter. You know, and it's kind of funny because when Linda described Larry Hagman as the Pied Piper, that's how John had been described. Uh, and many people didn't realize that Larry was quite the jokester, quite the instigator of fun. What's, you know, your most colorful Larry Hagman memory? <laughs> <laughs> if you can tell us. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, I sound like one of those actors. I really, there are some things that I can't tell. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was, a, he was a devilish man. Um, mm-hmm. He really was. And I, I, let's see, I can't tell that story. Um, uh, <laughs> At least not well, now, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I mean, um, he really, you know, embrace the, the the new cast. I don't know if this is exactly what you're looking for. My mind's blank on the pranks, but um, sure. you know, he he really made a point of. I mean, he was so weak near the end. I mean, he really was. He would show up to set, and he, he found the strength to do the scenes, but he was tired. And this yeah. is unusual for a man who really was so vibrant throughout his years. Mm-hmm. But um, a lot of the cast, Brenda Strong, you know, told me when, that when she did her lines uh, on on the stand, that Larry came up to her afterwards and said, you know, man, you you delivered it. And, and there was a moment where Linda Gray and Patrick Duffy and Larry were in a in a limo being taken somewhere, and, and Larry called out to to Brendan and said, "Hey, you you join us. You're one of us now." Uh-huh, um, uh-huh. And and he did the same thing with with the younger cast um, with 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 Josh Henderson, who he really took under his wing, and Josh called him Pops. Oh, cool. um, and so he really wanted to make sure this younger cast felt welcome into the to the Ewing legacy. Uh, so that's yeah. the gift he gave to them. He yeah. did. And I, and I think he gave the gift of, you know, helping revive this institution for the next generation of actors and viewers. I hope so. I, I hope the show can continue without him. I don't know if it can. Yeah. Do we think a, a third season is a done deal or is that to be determined? It's to be determined. Um, I will say that, you know, the way... Uh, the JR Memorial episode ends. Um, there are so many cliffhangers that are left dangling that well, I think will definitely take us at least to the end of the season, and, and people will have to watch to find out what JR was up to. Because mm-hmm. He left a lot, a lot of loose ends. And these, these producers are really smart, and I think they realize that they've really got to up the ante now that Larry's gone. Yes. And they're working on the cliffhanger now. They're working on, they're still writing the final episode. The last two uh, airings will be two hour episodes. So um, oh, wow. it's going to wrap up quite quickly in mid April. And then we'll find out if there's a third season. I hope there will be. I do, too. I think there's plenty of story left to tell. And, you know, Cynthia Sidre, is is that how you pronounce her name? Executive Sidre. She has done quite an amazing job of bringing the story forward while honoring the rich history and legacy characters of the show. So many TV reboots and remakes blow up like, you know, Pam Ewing on a country road. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> but you know, when Charlie's Angels, Bionic Woman, to an extent V, and and many others have failed in recent years, why, from your point of view, has this Dallas revival succeeded? Well, I mean, the ones you named, they were continuations. Mm-hmm. Like you say, you said uh, V, you said uh, Charlie. Charlie's Angels. Yeah, they, they were they were re- reboots. Mm-hmm, and and mm-hmm. Uh, Cynthia was very clear early on to not call this a reboot. It was a continuation. Mm-hmm. Um, so everything that happened that we loved about the first Dallas has happened. And mm-hmm. this is just picking up with the Ewings many years later. I mean, I would have loved, how fun would Charlie's Angels have been if Jackson Smith had been oh, the new yeah. Charlie, if Charlie had died. And, yes. and he actually, McGee, or somebody, I think it was McGee, someone told me that it was supposed to come out that Charlie was a woman. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> They, yeah, but I, I don't, it wasn't going to be Jacqueline. But that would have been smart, you know. I mean, yeah, Bionic yeah. Woman. I mean, there was nothing about that show that felt like the original, and, and to no. call her Jamie Summers was ridiculous. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, she wasn't Jamie. Jamie was a school teacher who was sweet, and you know, we could nerd out on TV for a while here and get off topic. But I mean, sure. the point is, is that this is the Dallas that we knew. Yep. we have Patrick there, we have Linda there, we have the supporting players who pop in. It feels like returning home. It is, and the fact that they are including, when possible, Lucy and Ray, and now Gary, and of course Cliff and Afton. And and Joan Van Ark's coming back, Valene, and she looks amazing. Wait till you see Joan Van Ark in her episode. She looks so good. She's in the episode after the memorial. Well, people are going to love that, and... For this episode of Reimagine That, um, I'm interviewing Morgan Brittany. Uh, wouldn't that be fun to see her come back? Yeah, you know, especially with the villainous J.R. now sadly gone. How could the bitchy Catherine Wentworth return bring the story forward in a way that honors the show's rich history, especially between those two families? Any kind of ideas of what you might like to see happen there? Yeah, you know, Chris, I don't really know what's going to happen in the last few episodes, but... But as I said, I've seen episode eight, which is the memorial, and there is some information that services about Pam's whereabouts. Oh. And as we know, Catherine Wentworth was obsessed yeah. with her half sisters coming and going, and, and she, I believe, was involved in whisking her away from the hospital after she was mummified after her <laughs> oil tanker explosion. Right. Um, Right. She was always in that mix. So, I mean, I think it would, uh, it would make great sense to find out that Catherine was somehow involved with Pam being gone all these years. and yep. uh, Or they could just simply go with, with Catherine making one last attempt to, to get Bobby since she really was, was obsessed with him. You know, uh, remember, I mean, she, yes. she sat him down with her car, even though it didn't really happen. It, even though it was all a bad dream. Even you though know. it was all a bad dream. <laughs> so <laughs> Catherine is alive and I'm sure well and plotting something. But I think Brenda Strong could well, take unwell. her on. I think she's hopefully uh, unwell. And unwell, all <laughs> right. Well, that would be a treat to see. In closing, what do you think about where the show is right now, losing Larry Hagman, Victoria making this a final statement that she won't come back? Do you feel like this show in two seasons has sort of gotten its sea legs to continue on in its own right without those two sort of iconic characters? Well, you know, what I feel, Chris, is that this was a, a blessing. and it's a, it's a miracle this show ever happened. Mm-hmm. The fact that this happened before Larry passed, the fact that Larry got to play out a year and a half of, of J.R. scenes before he died is a gift to the actors who got to work with him, yeah. gift to the fans. But the biggest gift went to Larry mm-hmm. because he loved this character so much. I mean, imagine if we'd gotten a Three's Company reunion before we lost John. Yeah. Imagine what that would have meant to that cast to have each other together, to mm-hmm. come together, for us to see them one more time. I mean, it's a miracle this happened. So if this is, is all we get, right. then it's, 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 it's enough. But I think that, that Larry and certainly the cast want the show to continue because mm-hmm. JR, as they said, will continue. He's stirred up so much trouble yeah. and messed with these characters' lives that, that I think one more season to figure out what he was up to and, and get the Ewings together would, would be would be a fitting legacy. So hopefully hopefully they'll come up with enough story to make another season worthwhile. I, I hope so. And you know the the spirit of Larry Hagman remains and one yeah. of your 
TV Guide cover stories, Linda and I think Patrick talked about feeling his presence there on set. So how cool that Larry Hagman, at age 80, got to yeah. book in this and have his swan song as JR. So it's been and quite a trip. Sweetest, one of the sweetest little things, Chris, you'll see right from the beginning how special this episode is on Sunday, Dear's Masterpiece. Because the producers did a, a new opening sequence, a one-time opening sequence with different music, different mm-hmm. cards to cut in that's honoring Larry, and it's really, really moving and special. That's great. Well, we will all be yeah. watching, and uh, we'll also be tuning in online to see you moderate this panel at Paley Fest, and, and we look forward to seeing more Dallas cover stories. You've oh, done a great I hope job. so. Wouldn't that be great? It'd be a great continuation. <laughs> so thank you so well, much, Will. Thank you, Chris, for honoring TV and doing what you do. Well, I thank you, and thank you for honoring classic TV and always covering that in TV Guide, as well as the new stuff. It's a it's a good blend, and we love your column, and hopefully we'll have you back on the show talking about another classic one of these days. Anytime, Chris, anytime. J.R. Ewing was the king of TV schemers, and now we talk to the queen of the TV backstabbers, Dallas star Morgan Brittany. When we last saw her as the conniving, devious Catherine Wentworth, she was trying to take her bandaged sister Pam out of the hospital, and Bobby Ewing stopped her. This was after we thought she had killed Bobby Ewing by running him over with a car, which was intended for Pam, and we later found out that it was all just a dream of Victoria Principal. Well, now that we know Victoria's not coming back to the show, finally, maybe the media can focus on the real lady of Dallas that people want back, Morgan Brittany as Catherine Wentworth, in this first of our two-part extensive interview. So let's join this lovely blue-eyed lady, this Texas vixen, and see what she has in store for us now. Hi, Chris. It's Morgan Brittany. Hi, Morgan. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. I am thrilled to have you on our show. Thanks. So, Morgan, I am one of the legions of Dallas fans who grew up with the original series and witnessed all of your treachery as Catherine (laughs) Wentworth. (laughs) In fact, I even remember TV Guide calling you. Dallas backstabber Morgan Brittany. Oh, yes, I know. I know that'll probably be on my obit someday. <laughs> she was a beloved mother, wife, and backstabber. <laughs> 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 and, you know, as another aside, as a kid, I remembered you as the good Morgan alongside Miss Fairchild's bad Morgan in the TV movie The Initiation of Sarah, which was one of my favorites. Yes. So yes. all of a sudden on Dallas, you're the really, really bad Morgan. Um, did this dichotomy of good and bad relative to your image with the public, did that influence your take on this character in Dallas? You know, it was it was very, very funny because when the producers decided to add the character of Pamela's sister, they really didn't know which direction they wanted to go in. They didn't know whether she wanted to be a good guy or a bad guy. They didn't know how old they wanted her to be. It was basically one of those things where when the right person walked in the door, yeah. that was it. You know, that so so that of course they interviewed everybody in the world, and I really didn't know at the time when I was going on the casting that she was supposed to be a bad guy. Oh. Nobody really knew that. Yeah. So that was just something that maybe on a subconscious level, do you think you emanated something in that interview that made them think, hmm, she could be a force to be reckoned with as this character? Oh, I I know that as a fact. Yeah. I know that because I'm sure you've heard this story. I've told it before, but... When I went on the audition, I had just gotten married, and I really was not in the frame of mind to start going back on auditions and interviews, and I remember when my agent called me and they said, we need you to go over to MGM, uh, Lorimar Studio, and uh, audition, they're adding a new character on Dallas. Well, I was not really a Dallas fan, so I didn't know that much about the show, Mm -hmm. and I told them, I said, oh, I'm not in the mood to do this. I really don't want to go there. Oh, just go. They're adding a character. Just go. So 
I ended up going on the audition, and of course, my attitude was, I don't want to be here. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> I had to wait two hours in the waiting room with a, you know, a million other girls. And when I got in there, I had a real attitude. I uh, mean, wow. my attitude was, I don't want to be here. Do, is this all you guys need? Because I've got other things to do. <laughs> <laughs> And they said, oh, I she could be good. I know. And when I walked out the door, I thought, oh, my gosh, I've been in the business all these years. Mm-hmm. I've never done anything like that. What have I done? So I called my agent. And I said, you are going to get the worst response on this because I'm so rude and so <laughs> nasty. <laughs> but I think, you know what it is? It's, it's a case of. I think they saw something and a direction for that character and maybe, you know, like all the puzzle pieces just kind of fell into place yeah. that day. It was meant to be. Well, you, you certainly made an impression there and you definitely made an impression with viewers. And here in a few minutes, I want to go back and talk about your childhood career as an actor because your okay. career spans back to the 50s. It's amazing. Yeah. But first, since TNT revived Dallas and in the last year or so, there's been a groundswell of fans saying, bring back Catherine Wentworth, bring back Morgan Brittany. What do you make of this sort of campaign? Well, I um, never didn't really think about it too much, but I always, I always thought they never resolved my character. They never resolved mm-hmm. my storyline. It just was kind of out there hanging. Yeah. You know, you don't know where she went after the dream sequence. Mm-hmm. I came back and I did a couple of shows and then... Pam and I kind of just disappeared, uh-huh. uh, and no, nobody really knew where we went, what happened, you know, what what was going on. So they kind of left that hanging. They did. And I, I never could figure out why they didn't ever want to resolve it. But when I started getting a lot of Facebook people and Twitter messages saying, are you coming back to the show? We really would love to see you back on the show. Oh my gosh, Catherine would be so great. You know, they're bringing Cliff back and you guys have such a feud and, you know, and Mm -hmm. it did make a lot of sense. It did make a lot of sense to me yep. at the time, and I thought, wow, they could have a, a really good storyline and plot line going oh, if yeah. they revived oh, Catherine. Yeah. yeah. Well, the show, I've noticed, has done a pretty good job of weaving the history in with the younger generation, and Catherine was definitely right in the middle of that Barnes-Ewing saga uh, as such an instigator <laughs> and a troublemaker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, especially this is a pivotal time in this, you know, reboots development given the recent loss of Larry Hagman and his iconic yeah. J.R. Ewing. And by the way, you wrote a lovely tribute to him, I noticed, uh, online oh. on your column. Very nice piece Thank that you, you wrote. You bet. Larry was a very special person. And mm-hmm. um, I have a, you know, a, a space in my heart that's just so empty now that he's gone. Oh. And, uh, you know, we had some of the best backstage on set fun and uh he he taught me so much about how to play a villain Mm -hmm. you know how how to do it how to really do it Mm -hmm. in in a way that would be memorable to the public you know that's right and uh i i learned a lot from larry i really did so he encouraged you to embrace the villainy (laughs) have fun with it yes he he really did and you know, he told me, he said, look, the J.R. Ewing character is totally different from Catherine because mm-hmm. Catherine is a little crazy. Right. And he said, you have to play her differently. You can't play her basically like he played J.R. because J.R. Right. was cat and mouse playing with everybody where Catherine was, you know, she was obsessed. She, she had, was. you know, psychotic tendencies. Mm-hmm. So he really helped me out. And in a lot of the episodes that he directed, you know, he would give me guidance on that, which oh, which I cool. found to be, you know, really helpful. That's very cool. You know, and and, but now on this reboot, there's suddenly a void of classic Dallas villainy. And Catherine really was uh, to female Dallas malevolence what um, Jr. was to the male archetypal evil. If the produce, yes. if the producers called you, which I so hope they have or will, called your agent and said, "Come on back to South Fork," you would say at this point. 
<laughs> well, I, you know, I, I would definitely give it some serious thought because yeah. I know, you know, so many people that are just dedicated fans that would love for me to go back. However, I've just, my life has moved in such a different direction now yes. that, um, I, you know, it would be, it would be really different for me to enter back into the Hollywood scene. I, I haven't really been a part of the Hollywood scene in a long time. I, right. I miss acting tremendously. I really do. Um, mm-hmm. I went out, I, I don't know whether you know that I went out and did a um, Broadway show tour of MAME. Yeah. Yeah, a few years back. And I had such a fabulous time and I didn't realize how much I missed performing wow. and re- you know when you've done it your whole life yeah and it's something that I've done ever since I was five years old wow. and then when you walk away from it and you get another taste and you come back it's just it's in your blood that's what they say you know it, it is. never goes away it is especially for a delicious character iconic character like Catherine I think that that might spark all sorts of creative passion in you again yeah you know it's it's very true and I, i've given it so much thought like where would i go where would she be in her life now mm-hmm. you know she had been taken in for attempted murder but she had so much money and so many connections she could have gotten off you know yeah. maybe she she decided to change her i don't know to maybe change the way that she was going to go about things I mean, as you mature and get older, yeah. you come into different phases in your life, and I often wonder where Catherine would be, but I know for a fact. And it, I mean, there are film clips that say to J.R. Ewing, I will get you. Uh-huh. You, know, and it, it, you know, it's almost like that thing, well, wait a minute, did she have something to do with him dying? With mm-hmm. maybe Catherine in Venezuela, and then she got these guys to, you know, take care of him? I mean, I... I don't know. I've been thinking about all these scenarios. And yep. then of course, she has this, you know, this vendetta against Cliff because he took part of her father's company. That's and right. She's never, she's never going to give up on that. And that's why I thought, wow, there's so many places for this to go. So many places. And your very last scene on Dallas was Patrick shooing you away from the bandaged Pam. Uh, leave, right. leave, leave, Catherine. Do you think she'd still have a little bit of a score to settle with Bobby? Do you think she might re-spark her obsession with him? You know, I think at this point... She knows he doesn't want her. Yeah. And I think that it would be a revenge thing for her. I think that would be either to break up his marriage or destroy South Fork or whatever would do to get back at him. It's like a woman scorned. You know what I mean? And she's had 25 years to mature and present herself perhaps as reformed, but have even more cunning and and dangerousness beneath that surface. (laughs) Oh, exactly. And I, I, you know, I had one of my fans brought up a point that, you know, Catherine had had a, an affair with Jr. And not mm-hmm. too long after that, she disappeared. Uh-huh. Possibly she had a child, you know, like the most evil um, child ever. <laughs> yeah, <really. laughs> that would be good. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the possibilities to use that show's iconic era and such a legacy character to bring the story forward and give depth to all of these, the younger generation that's still feuding with the older generation, would you would just fit right in there. So I'm all for them bringing you back. You know what? I have I have this fantasy uh-huh. that they ask me to come back and my entrance into the show is literally sitting in a chair and you don't see anything except the back of the chair. The chair turns around. There's a big hat. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I look up. And it's Catherine, right? <laughs> is it is that the same hatted woman that whisked Pam away from the hospital? Exactly. You know, exactly. It, in your heart of hearts, was that Catherine that did that to take Pam away for some devious reason? I always thought so. Yeah. I always thought so. Yeah. 
Well, there you go. Late last week, you know, Victoria Principal released a statement after much speculation saying she would not be coming back as Pam. She didn't want to mess with the legacy, which she compares to Romeo and Juliet of Pam and Bobby. Uh Many fans disagree. What's your take on this, having known Victoria, having worked with her? I understand Victoria was always a little bit out of the core group of pranksters and fun-loving, easygoing types on the show. What's your take on that all these years later? Well, I think that um, Victoria was, she was very serious Mm -hmm. when it came to her character, and she took it seriously. Now, that set was, you know, between Patrick and Larry, it was joke city, you know. (laughs) So, yeah, you'd be in the middle of, of rehearsal, and, you know, they'd be pulling pranks on each other or somebody in the scene. So you never really got a chance to rehearse very well. <laughs> I mean, you had to be on your, you had to be on your game all the time. But right. I think that Victoria, I think she closed the door on Pam yeah. when she left the show. I, yeah. I really do. And, and I think that she moved on and does not want to revisit it for whatever reasons she has not to revisit it. But you know, I mean, I respect her for that. Yeah. Um, maybe she does feel that she wants people to remember her as she was mm-hmm. and as Pam was and keep that image, which I think is great. Now, for me, yeah. I don't care if people see me as a 60-year-old Catherine. doesn't bother me a bit. <laughs> well, you're, well, you're looking darn good. Um, <laughs> and, and you look very much like we saw you 25 years ago. So uh, it would just seem a natural plug-in. I mean, you and Sue Ellen have been in a a time warp, you and Linda Gray, (laughs) aging so well. So, uh, yeah, I can see that. You know, you mentioned a possible love child with J.R., Demon Spawn. Uh Uh, (laughs) Many people know, but maybe not everyone does, that you had a successful career as a child actor and that you were born Suzanne Capito. Is that pronounced correctly? Right. That's right. Uh-huh. That's right. And you only really played a bad seed once in an episode of The Twilight Zone with the little dummy, the ventriloquist dummy, yes. which always yes, creeps that... me out. <laughs> I know. Uh, I know. That, that was, what, that was a, a, a really fun episode because I got to work with Jackie Cooper, yeah. who had also been a child star, you know. Well, so uh, yeah. it, it was great. It was great fun. And, and to be on the set and Rod Sterling was on set and, you know, it was really television in its in its heyday. You yes. know, it was oh, great. Wasn't it? And, you know, as a kid, because you had played so many wholesome roles, which I want to touch on briefly. But it was that sort of bad seed role as a kid particularly delicious for you to sort of play a little bit of a nasty character? You know, I played so many different roles. That that was the fun of being a kid actor before yeah. I really got before I really grew up and got a certain image which mm-hmm. was, you know, more of a kind of glamorous girl. Yeah. Um when I was a kid I could play anything. I did the outer limits where I played a blind child. Mm-hmm. I played a, a Kentucky Appalachian blind child with Richard Boone. Uh, wow. And then, of course, there was wow. Gypsy, where I was Baby June in Gypsy. With and Natalie then I'd Wood. Do West with Natalie Wood. And then I'd go from that to playing the everyday girl in Yours, Mine, and Ours as the daughter of Henry Fonda. So yeah. I had the flexibility back then mm-hmm. to be able to jump into any kind of a character at all. And it was, it was really great. Of course, I loved playing the bratty little girl because <laughs> right. it was different. you know it was different for me i hadn't really done that i'd always played these little you know pitiful children <laughs> with some kind of a disability you know? <laughs> but uh it really it really was fun and people do remember that a lot they, they remember that episode a lot they do and they also remember you were opie's first girlfriend in the andy griffith show 
Yeah. I, I was a little bit of a bad guy in that, too, but I uh-huh. turned out to be okay at the end. <laughs> you, you got to, and, and Mayberry. There can't be too much evil there. That's true. And, and then you were attacked by winged creatures and Hitchcock's The Birds. Uh, you were, you've, yes. You've worked with some of the greats, Lucy, Natalie Wood. You have this oh. career that spans <laughs> so many decades. You know, it's. It, I, I look back on it now, and I think of all the, the legends that we've lost. And, yeah. you know, I look back on it, and to be directed by Mervyn Leroy and Alfred Hitchcock and, mm. you know, work with... I, I did a show in Las Vegas where I danced with Gene Kelly That's and, right. you know, the Bob Hope and Mickey Rooney and Eddie Foy. Um, wow. People that, you know, that, that a lot of people don't remember anymore, but mm-hmm. just to, to work with Rosalind Russell, Natalie Wood, Carl Malden, wow. um, wow. you know, Rod Taylor, Tippi Hedren was wonderful. I mean, wow. it's, it, I have such amazing memories. And I put down a list of all these people. Claire Trevor, who worked with me on the Love Boat, believe mm-hmm, it or not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and here I had idolized her from her days of Key Largo, you know, wow. with Humphrey Bogart. Wow. And here she is playing my mother on a show. So here I have this career that started in 19, I think it was 1956 or 1955, something like that. Wow. And I look back on it now and I think how fortunate I was yeah. to be able yeah. to to live in, in Hollywood at the time that I did and to be part of one of the last big Hollywood musicals that were done at Warner Brothers. And oh, yeah. it was just, it was an, absolutely an awesome time. And then to move on into the 70s and the 80s and yep. do an iconic yep. show like Dallas, you know? You've got a great book in you or two. <laughs> one got, of these days right well what propelled you at age five into a career as a child actor your mom was a single mom and i understand you you sort of helped support the family yeah um i you know of course when you're very very young you don't you do what your mom says and you yeah. go to acting classes or dance lessons or you do whatever you're told to do. And so I really didn't know anything other than dancing class, singing lessons, acting lessons. That's what I did. That was my life. Mm -hmm. And they got me, they started me working because it was a way of producing income Mm -hmm. um, so that we could live. I mean, I literally lived in a hotel on West 6th Street in downtown LA in, in in an old dilapidated hotel in yeah. one room wow. and then we had the basement we had a, sometimes we could go down to the basement and stuff but it was really really broke city I mean we didn't yeah. have any money at all so yeah. of course when I started working and I, I think one of the very first things I did was sea hunt with Lloyd Bridges mm-hmm. and you know that the money was amazing yeah. I mean all of a sudden you had a five and six year old kid and I mean, back then, it, it was good money, if you look back on it now. And then, of mm-hmm. course, when Gypsy came along, and then you're signed to a contract, and it's like, oh, this is great. Yeah. But I didn't know any different. You know, I went to school when I could go to school. Uh-huh. Um, I didn't play with other kids because I was always either training or I was on auditions. Wow. So I didn't grow up. I didn't grow up as a kid. I, yeah. I, I missed out on a childhood, you know? It, well, it, you hear those stories sometimes um, from actors and performers that are always working. How did the ebb and flow of roles over the next 10 years or so prepare you for the pluses and the minuses of showbiz? Because didn't your agent once tell your mom there's nothing left for her, you know, after yours, yes. mine, and ours? And that, I mean, yes, that must have been exactly. crushing. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what happened because I was, I think I was 15, 14 or 15 when I did that and I was going through adolescence and, you know, it was one of those things where the phone would ring occasionally for an audition, but it was not like it was when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And of course, my mom thought it would never end. She thought, oh, this is great. It's going to last forever. Well, it didn't last forever. Mm -hmm. And the agent called and I just happened to pick up the extension phone 
And I heard him say, I'm sending the photos back because there's nothing we can do for her. Have a nice life. Oh, my God. You know, and it, here I was just devastated because yeah. that was all I felt. That's that's the only reason I felt I had any value oh, wow. was because I was working and I was supporting my family. And, and now that was no longer going to happen. I didn't feel valuable as a human being anymore. So I went through a really bad period as a teen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, was it, it so bad that you thought, hey, I don't want to be on this earth bad? Or did you ever quite get to that no, point? I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it it got to that it got to that at a certain point because oh, I felt that I was I felt that I was not uh, I guess I I felt I wasn't contributing to yeah. any anything yeah. anymore I was just back to being nothing and nobody and uh. it's sort of like you know the only thing I can equate it with is is politics where, mm -hmm. you know, you're running for office and everyone's following you around and you're making headlines and then you lose the election and they don't even know who you are. So right. that's kind of like what I went through. And I got to a really low point and I remember just begging and praying to God, please yeah. tell me, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I'm, I, I, I have nothing. And yeah. I had no money left. So. Wow. As All a the teenager. money had been, yeah, the money had been spent. I didn't have any future, really. You know, I wasn't trained to do anything except act. And now Hollywood's telling me they don't want me. So, Yikes. you know, what do I do? I, I had to reinvent myself. And reinvent yourself, you did. I mean, tell us about the decision and the process to sort of reimagine your life, reinvent yourself as a whole new person named Morgan Brittany. There's a great story about where you found that name, too. Yeah, it was, um, you know, I was, after yours, mine, and ours, uh, and, and that devastating time frame, I went back to public school, and I, I went to high school and just kind of closed the door on acting and everything. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I would try to do what I could do and maybe get into another profession. And I was looking at journalism because mm -hmm. that was kind of like within, you know, the media. Yes. So when I, I graduated from high school, I did a stint with Gene Kelly as a dancer, mm -hmm. just as a dancer in Las Vegas. And then I came back and decided that I would try to take some classes at college to see what I could do. And I there was a friend of mine in photojournalism class, and he said, I need to take some photos for my portfolio. Would you be the model for it? Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, I don't really want to do that, you know. <laughs> and he said, well, just do it as a favor for me. So we took some fashion photos, and he started shopping them around to try to get work and took them to agencies. Well, the agencies weren't thrilled with his photos, but they loved the model. <laughs> ah, oh, that's good. He came back to me at school and he said, you know, I'm getting an awful lot of inquiries about who you are. Mm -hmm. And they, and he, you really should go see these agents and you really should go see these people. And I said, I don't want to do that anymore. I, yeah. I, I don't want to do that. And he said, well, you know, I really think it might be a good idea for you. And wow. I thought, well, okay, I think what I'll do is maybe go in and see one agent. Mm -hmm. And I got myself all dressed up. And really thought I looked great, you know. I, I thought I did. Yeah. And I went over to Hollywood, and I went into the agency, and this older lady who owned the agency, she looked me up and down, and she said, come with me. <laughs> and she took me to the back uh, room where she had a class of young models. Mm -hmm. And she stood me up in front of this group of girls, and she said, girls, this is the way not to look. <laughs> Aren't you glad you got back into that? <laughs> I know, and I thought, what am I doing? And Abuse. I thought, oh my gosh, I thought, this is crazy, what am I doing? So I got in my car, I was furious with myself mm. for doing this, for putting myself back out there, and then it was like an epiphany hit me, mm -hmm. where I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, who is this person to tell me that I'm... I look wrong or that I'm never going to make it or that I'm never going to do anything. Who is this person? That's right. And it made me so angry mm -hmm. that I started deciding, I'm going to turn this around. I'm going to prove to these people that I'm not nothing anymore. 
So Great. I tried to get some money together. I ended up selling my car, and I had enough money, and I said, I'm moving to New York. Mm-hmm. So I moved to New York City. Now, on the airplane, I had I was reading a lot of romance novels back in the day, mm-hmm. and I would pick up secondhand books at, at you know Salvation Army or Goodwill or whatever. I'd buy these books for a quarter. Oh, yeah. And I bought this book called Flood Tide by Frank Yerby, mm-hmm. and it was a romance novel of the South, kind of like a Gone with the Wind thing. Oh. And I got on the airplane, and I hadn't looked at the book, and I got on the airplane, and I didn't know where I was going. I didn't know what I was doing other than New York City. Mm-hmm. So I opened the book. And the very first line in the book said, Morgan Brittany was mistress of such and such a plantation. And uh, I went, whoa, I love that name. Wow. That is awesome. So I decided when I got off the plane in New York City, now remember, this was like 1971, uh-huh. I... I became Morgan Britton. Wow, that is so cool! It was like uh, that? that God was attracting you to that book to s- open that page and, yeah. and give yeah. give you that inspiration to to start a whole new image. And was it a personality? I mean, do you feel like at that point you sort of became a different person on the inside too? Yeah, I really did because I became. It's almost like. They had beat me up so bad yeah. in Hollywood as, as a child actor and growing up and everything. And, of course, I didn't fall into the trap that a lot of child stars do where they either get substance abuse, yeah. you know, alcoholics or drugs, or some of them ended up in jail. And, it, I mean, it's, mm. been, it's very tragic for some child actors. Yeah. But I didn't – that never happened to me. I was very fortunate because at least I had, you know, enough of a brain not to do that. Yeah, yeah. And – the only thing that I must say that it did is it it toughened me up mm-hmm. and it made me a more, you know, cynical kind of person in a way. Mm-hmm. I didn't believe everything everybody told me. Um, I, I forged ahead and I knew I knew that I had to hit the streets in New York. I knew it was going to be tough. And until I could establish myself as the new Morgan Brittany. Yeah, it was tough. It was really tough because mm-hmm. Eileen Ford didn't want me as a model until I went to Japan. And then, of course, after that, she did. And, wow. um, you know, the, the very small time agent, he was the only one who really believed in me. And then I bluffed my way into the, the ad agencies. You know, the, the, the TV show Mad Men? Yes. Yeah. That's the way it was. For me in New York, where oh, you'd wow. go into casting sessions and you'd literally go to the advertising agency. You'd sit there and you'd read the copy and then you'd go in and you'd read for five or six clients, five or six guys. There was no videotape back then. Yeah. It was just like the show, just like Mad Men. And then they'd hire you. Well, you know, one thing led to another, and I ended up doing very well in New York. And Morgan Brittany was born (laughs) alive and well in New York. Right. Exactly. Perhaps this sort of steely resolve that you developed, maybe that was a part of you that was in Catherine, you know. You are very different from Catherine, but there must have been some common denominator there that helped you make that character so palpable of someone that would never give up. Yeah, yeah. I I truly believe that. I think that, you know, a lot of rejection, and you know Hollywood, they they don't mince words. I mean, Mm -hmm. in uh, reviews of what you do, in criticism of how you look. Oh. I mean, it's out there, and it, and and it's very blatant and in your face, and you have to learn to take it. Now, having been discarded as a, you know, here I was, an actress that was sought after as a child and working all the time, and then all of a sudden just discarded for no reason, really, except for the fact that you grew up. Yeah. I mean... It's crazy. It makes no sense. But when you try to put it all into perspective, the next time around, when you do round two in your career, you know, okay, this is not going to last forever. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do what I have to do. I'm going to make the most of it. It's like I don't understand people who are on a hit show and they quit. Mm-hmm. I don't get that. They <laughs> no. walk away from it. And and, and I kept I kept thinking to myself, even when Patrick Duffy left Dallas, yeah. I thought, Why would you do this? You're on a number one show. Incredible you know, gift. Every, <laughs> yeah, 
and and I and you see, I had been through it, and I know how hard it was yeah. even to get a pilot, and then to get a pilot sold, and then to make it successful. The odds are so against you that I would never walk away. No. And I think that's one of the reasons why I would be more inclined to go back to Dallas mm-hmm. if they asked me, because I know. Yes, that's it, that's kind of a blessing in a way that they it, want you. you em- know? Embracing opportunity because you've seen the great end of things and you've seen the dismal end of things, and you don't take it for granted. That's exactly right. And um, I, I just I learned a lot of life lessons mm-hmm. um, having experienced that at an early age, and thank goodness i wasn't self-destructive and i and i didn't fall into a trap that a lot of child actors do and that is the end of part one of our fascinating two-part journey with morgan Brittany. stay tuned later in march we'll hear the rest of her interview where she talks about her child career as suzanne capito and reinventing herself as morgan Brittany. we'll hear more about dallas we'll hear about her memories of joan collins in a tv movie she did where she got her inspiration for the evil Catherine wentworth we'll hear a lot more some more Larry Hagman memories, so check back with us at the end of March. In the meantime, as they say in So Planned, South Fork and Beyond, to be continued. By plowing down Bobby Ewing in that fateful, fateful episode of Dallas, Morgan Brittany's Catherine Wentworth launched the infamous dream season of TV's soapiest hit. But we have our own Texas lady who has her own Texas-sized dream. She's going to share with us this episode of Reimagine That. Yvonne Reba, check out her website at yvonnerybacom moved to the United States in the early 80s during the TV zenith that Dallas reached. And she documented her dreams from 1980 and she looks back at a dream and gives us her insights. Hi there, Yvonne. How are you? I'm doing very well, Chris. Thank you. Oh, so great to hear. Uh, well, here we are in March already. I know. And <laughs> crazy. <laughs> um, and this is our Dallas theme episode. Yeah. So being a Texan and with someone who has lived in Texas at different points in her life in the last 30 plus years. Do you have a good Texas dream for us? I do. Yes, Great. I do. I was looking through my books. You know, I keep journals of my dreams. And I looked through one of the first journals that I ever did. Started off in like the 70s. And this was a dream from Saturday, December the 1st, 1980. Ah. So it's quite a stretch. Yeah, the year J.R. was shot. <laughs> yeah, right. And, of course, the Dallas was huge in England. Remember, I'm still in England at this point. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. We didn't move here till two years later, December of 82. But we were in the process, you know, of thinking about moving. Mm-hmm. And we'd come over on, on vacation and stay with my sister and her husband in Austin, Texas. Aha. Uh-huh. And so we love Texas. You know, from the very beginning, that's where we, we first saw the U.S. I mean, from this sort of... Texan viewpoint. Interesting. And, uh, yeah, so we had Dallas in England. Everybody was, you know, glued to the set, watching it all, and um, and it was very different from where we lived, of course. So very over interesting. Here into Texas for vacation, everybody said, "Did you go to Dallas? Did you see? This? Did you see South Fork?" <laughs> yes. Oh yeah, we popped up to South Fork. Yeah. Gotta see um, South Fork. <laughs> Well, that's very interesting to have seen it from the American point of view during the show's heyday, and then England as well. You must have had some interesting perceptions of the United States. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, People did not understand that Texas is not all cowboys and, um, you know, the kind of thing they saw on TV. Yeah, yeah. You see, now, when Dallas came out, even though Dallas did tend to go towards the cowboy side of it, in the cowboy hats, the boots, you know, all that kind of thing, mm-hmm. um, and horses and so on, at least they started to see big cities. That's right. Uh, you know, it wasn't all, I'm not saying gun smoke, but, you know, that kind of thing. Because now we've got um, oil and high-rise buildings and big money. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. I, mean, I knew this because my sister had been married for years at this point. 
and uh, had been over in Texas and you know started a family. So I knew all that stuff, but of course, taking it back home and telling people that was something else. Very so this was a dream that I had about Texas, mm -hmm. but while I was still in England. Okay, great. Okay. okay, now I have to give you a little bit of a story here. Uh -huh. The last time that we were in Texas, in Austin, my sister, they'd moved to this new house, and it was built on a rocky hill with a little subdivision um, there, and they had displaced a whole lot of creepy crawlies and things that had lived there for, you know, eight eons, uh, including scorpions. So Ugh. this particular <laughs> night, yes, yeah. Believe me, we don't have scorpions in England, so it wasn't something I was, uh, you know, expecting. Right. Well, I had, yeah, I just got into bed, and my husband was in the bathroom, and I pulled this book I was reading out of the, um, the, the side table with the drawer, and something slipped across my hand and into the sheets, and I was just opening the book, and I thought, wait a minute, what was that? Ew. And then I thought, you know what? I didn't like the feel of that. I'm going <laughs> to get out of bed and see what it is. <laughs> so and my sister had these very pale brown sheets on the guest bed. So mm -hmm. I had to pull everything back and look carefully, and then I saw this scorpion. And it had its stinger curled round, and, and it was pale brown, too. So it wasn't easy to see. Ooh, and yeah. I thought, oh, my grief, what the heck, you know, this... This is like a big shock. So mm -hmm. I went and hammered on the bathroom door and said to my husband, you've got to come out here and get rid of this scorpion that's in the bed. And he said <laughs> back, don't be ridiculous. There isn't a scorpion in the bed, you know. And I thought, how does he know? He's in there. He just expects me to be, you know, like a woman, you know. Right. I have to off the deep end here. <laughs> Obviously, you know, having a hallucination. So I said, you come out here and see it. So he came up thinking it was probably some insect that I just, you know, got a bit over the top with. And when he saw it, he went, ah! <laughs> he said, have the color of my yeah. He said, oh, yeah. heavens, and he took nearly a whole roll of toilet tissue in a big ball and got a hold of this thing and put it down the toilet. So uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> that was the story, right? Yep. So that, I had been thinking about that that particular day, and then I had this dream at night. Great. And here's what I wrote. I had been thinking of the scorpion in our bed in Texas and presumably linked it with the stone that my sister had sent me, which she had found in Arizona in the desert. Hmm. She sent me a little present, and it was one of those um, like geodes or whatever they're called. You, mm -hmm. you have to cut it in half with a saw and then polish this thing up. And she sent me one and said, you know, you get a surprise when you cut into them. You never know quite what they're going to look like. Well, I still have that today. Mm -hmm. I have what she sent me. I polished it up in the metal workshop at school, and it was beautiful. And it was a pale brown with sort of creamy marble lines in it. Nice. So that was the stone. So I thought about, what shall I do? Okay? And I, mm -hmm. here's the dream. I'm sunbathing when I notice a scorpion crawling along my leg. There are several of them around me, but the one on me is the one I feel threatened by. And I slowly and very carefully maneuver it off me. I look for something with which to kill it, and I think the most suitable thing would be the cut quartz that Vera sent me from Arizona that I polished myself. I find that its flat, smooth surface is perfect for squashing the stinging creature, although the stone is not very big. Mm -hmm. So that was the dream, and then, of course, I woke up and I thought, what the heck is that about? Yeah, not a very long dream, but... Not very long, but... Vivid. It's not a very, very intense Believe me, when you find a scorpion crawling along your leg in a dream, you get, you know. Oh, yeah. So I thought about it. Now, I am not very, I don't like spiders, okay? Let's put it that way. <laughs> yep, I yep. have had freaked out about spiders. And, of course, I've came, come to Texas um, where we have big spiders, we have poisonous spiders, we have all that stuff. But I've learned to cope with it, and I've certainly got over all that now. But in the dream uh, that I'd had, I, I thought to myself when I woke up, you know, scorpions and spiders are from the same family. So I'm kind of like linking the two together here. And this is about me facing up to dangers, perhaps, it, when I come to live in Texas, because we were expecting to do that shortly after that. It took us longer than we thought to get here. But in that time frame, we were definitely planning on coming to live in Texas. Uh -huh. So I thought the dream is obviously about thoughts and what would life be like in Texas, the advantages and the disadvantages. And the dream supplied me with the solution to both. Uh -huh. The U.S. would be very interesting. And I was interested in my dream afterwards to see that 
I'd solved my problem, how to get rid of the scorpion crawling on me, with something that was a natural thing. The scorpion was a natural thing. And the stone was. It wasn't a poisonous spray or, you know, anything like that. It was something that had itself come from the earth. Right. So I picked something that I, in part, had created, too. I had polished the stone up so it was nice and smooth, and I could handle it because it wasn't very big. Mm-hmm. It was my handmade solution. Oh, now, okay. Yeah. Now, I when see. I woke up, I recognized that I felt a bit funny about killing the scorpion. But I didn't like killing things, and and yet I felt like I had to do something about it. But there was a feeling within me that perhaps I hadn't killed it. Perhaps I'd only just kept it down in some way, just made it difficult for the scorpion to get free. Right. Okay? Right. So, mm-hmm. so that wasn't the whole answer for me. I recognized that because I was born in November, and I am a Scorpio, uh... that the scorpion was probably part of me a play okay. on play on words yes. yep and that's something to look for in our dreams i have i've had many dreams about things like scorpions and various other stuff but refers to the person themselves like my uh, my husband was um a cancer okay mm-hmm. and i had a dream in which this huge crab appeared okay beside uh-huh. him, and i recognized you know that it was it was talking about him in the dream and so if you have that kind of a dream if you suddenly dream of lions and then you remember you're a Leo. Right, right. You know, or whatever. Then you, you've got to take that into account because it's, it's got more meaning than you thought it had. Well, it's like the dream that we talked about a few months back that I had probably around 1980 where Joyce DeWitt and I and Suzanne Summers were being chased by a bull while Joyce and I both are Taurus. Uh, and I didn't make that connection until recently. So it's yes. very, very interesting, the very subconscious. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, 1980, you were just a young kid. Just a, yeah, really? very cool. So <laughs> okay, many layers. <laughs> yes. Um, here's what I did to finish this off. Here's what I, at that point in my life in 1980, and I was very interested in dreams, of course, all my life, but I had been looking, um, studying the psychology of them and how the subconscious works. And I had learned the gestalt a way of, of interpreting dreams, which is to ask questions of everything that's in there. Imagining that you are everything in the dream and you have to give the answer that your subconscious will reveal. Okay, so uh-huh. you have to just dis- sort of detach yourself from the things in the dream and try and be the interpreter at the same time. It's not always easy, but you can do it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So here's what I got. I got, here's me, okay, and I said to the scorpion, what are you? And the scorpion said, I am you. I am the sting in the tail. You are a scorpio, and you have the power to sting, but you fear using this weapon, which is true. I was not a confrontational person. Because I was quite, I thought, a shrinking, you know, violet or whatever. Yes. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I think I've changed over the years, but I don't like to be nasty. Okay, and that's what the sting is. And right. I had people in my family who were very nasty and liked to use the sting and the sarcasm and so on. Mm-hmm. And so I, I felt that was dangerous and that I shouldn't use it. But there are times when you have to, you know, get your stinger out, I suppose. Mm-hmm. So I had said to the scorpion, well, should I use the stinger? And it said to me, no, not a lot. You have saved yourself by using the smooth and beautiful side of yourself. And that was the stone that I had polished up, cut and polished up, you know, and made it look great. And it was a paperweight, which I told you I've still got. Yeah, yeah. And you created that part of yourself. You worked on that part of yourself. So Uh so this is an illuminating glimpse into your two-sided personality. Because we all have the good and the bad in us. We all Uh, have a little bit of JR, a little bit of villainy. (laughs) Don't we wish that we could maneuver things the way that he did? Right, right. right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What a character. What a character, and uh, and same with Morgan Brittany's character, Catherine. Beautiful the... woman. Honestly, I always remember she's one of those unforgettable oh. actresses that has a very stunning kind of beauty. You know, you see it Gorgeous. in you. Gorgeous. Like, ah, you know, yeah. those eyes and the and hair those and everything. Piercing beautiful. eyes. Yeah. Well, you know, and those archetypal characters certainly use their stinger all the time but most of us we have those two sides to ourselves but most of us choose not to go with the nasty or some yes. of us anyway <laughs> i know a few that That's don't <laughs> well it can kill you you know yeah. i mean you're going to kill yourself in the, in the long run and i had seen 
some members of my family with this allowing their nasty side to full reign. And yeah. it doesn't help, believe me. All they get is a lot of misery later on. Right. And I, my sister and I both talked about this when we were younger and said, we do not want to go there. We're going to um, resist that. We're going to find a different way to be happy. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Not controlling other people or lashing out at them and so on. So that's, sort of, that's what the dream was really going at for me. It was explaining that, you know, yes, you do have a stinging side. Yeah. There is a part of you that's negative. Mm -hmm. uh, you're learning to control it. Keep doing what you're doing, all right? You know, and Scorpios are intense personalities, uh, if you believe in astrology. Yes. Uh, and uh, with work with me, I've always felt things intensely, I must say. Yeah. But, um, this was a very good dream. When I look back at it, I think, you know, yes, it certainly pointed at me in the right direction and said, don't let it get you, you know, don't allow that part of you to become stronger. Keep it under control with the smooth polish side. That's the way to go. That's fascinating. And you found later that these two aspects of yourself would come into play as you moved into the United States? Yes, yes, I did. What well, was a totally different culture from where I came from, so I had a lot of adapting. I'm an adaptable person, thankfully, and, uh, and I managed to do that. But um, I moved all over the state, so we didn't just live in Texas. Right. But Texas is where we used to come back, and we have lived in Houston to begin with, uh -huh. Austin for a short while, about a year. And we came back and we lived in San Antonio. And then my husband died. And yeah. then later on, I got married again. Um, I'm living an hour out of Houston in the piney forest. Oh, of beautiful. Texas. Beautiful. Absolutely, yeah. And I grew up in Oklahoma, and, and certainly that part of country is, is beautiful. But you do have to beware for the uh, the stingers in life. <laughs> you <laughs> do. Yeah, we, have, we, have, well, we don't have many scorpions here. It's rather... It's wetter, and you know, they prefer the um, the desert. Yes. But we've got the wasps and bees and all the other stuff. And you've got to watch yourself. There's always some hornets around. Although I'm very lucky, they don't seem to go for me. I find if you don't try and slap them away, they they're okay. Right, and uh, having lived in California, both of us, uh, mm, me now yeah. currently, we don't have a lot of insects, but our stingers are the two-legged kind out here. So you, <laughs> <laughs> you have to, the, the JRs and the, the Catherines. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> well, that's a, a that's a great, yeah, what a guy, and, and what a cool Texas dream. We appreciate it, and we look forward to the next one. Thank you very much, Chris. It's good to talk to you, dear. Reimagine That with Chris Mann was brought to you by Retroality TV. Copyright 2013 by Chris Mann. You can find us at retroality.tv and at reimaginethat.libsyn.com. Tweet us at Retroality TV or join us on Facebook at facebook.com slash retroality TV. And don't forget to check out our TV channel at youtube.com slash retroality TV. In conclusion, we leave you with this bit of South Fork philosophy, taken from the playbook of the murderous wannabe Catherine Wentworth. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again.